Hi, this is Dan here. Hope you're doing really well. Now, I don't do too many Q&As on this channel. I think this is only my second one, but here are all the questions for this week. And I've put timestamps below if you just want to search around for the one that interests you. But first up is this one. I usually only play by myself. I'm still learning. Do you recommend getting any gear to help the learning process? Loop pedal, drum machine, ETC. Right now, I did a video recently about good practice tools, so I'll put a link down below for that one. But really, uh, when you're just first learning, you don't need much, but obviously if you've got a bass and a practice amp, I think is good because hearing yourself back properly, I think kind of inspires you. But just a few little tools that I've been using recently that I, I think are worth mentioning. Number one is a, an app called Tom Player. Now I never had this when I was growing up and I was in many bands, so I kind of didn't really need it. But um, it's really great. It's got tab notation and loads of songs that you can play along to. You can slow it down, you can loop little sections, but just some sort of play along software I think is a really, really good thing. So that's one thing I would recommend. Um, another is to play along to music. So have like a little practice amp or something like that where you can feed you know, music into it with an aux cable. And then there's another bit of software called Rip X that I've been using, which you can remove the bass track. So you can just almost create your own backing track, get rid of the bass, have some headphones into your practice setup, and you can just be playing along as if you're in the band. I particularly love doing that with live records, actually. It sounds literally like you're in the band. That's a good way to go. Definitely have a metronome. That's I have a clip on one, a Lakata one that I put here that uh, just, you know, all kinds of metronome exercises that you can use to keep you in time. And, and drum machine, right? I, I have inbuilt drum loops on uh, Logic, which is what I use as my, as my software, but you can get dedicated drum machines. That's kind of up to you, whatever your setup is. Do you have a laptop? Do you, you know, do you have like a metronome that has drum beats on it? You can use phones, again, with an aux cable to go into your your little practice headphone setup, that's a good thing to have. But you don't need to have any of those things. You just need a bass and you just need to be playing every day and just a little bit of practice every day, just fundamentals, technique, and that's gonna help you much more than anything else. I watched tons of videos and practiced tons of shapes and other methods, but just haven't been able to get the feel for scales. Should I be learning all of the shapes on the fretboard for each scale, or should I just learn the notes and how would I apply that to other keys? Okay, a few things here. So haven't been able to get the feel for scales. Okay, I mean, just one thing is just to, to make music with scales as much as you can. So here's a G major scale. Don't run before you can walk. Just know an octave up and down. I think it's absolutely crucial to know the interval structure of that and how it's made up. What's the formula? So that is what it's made up of in terms of whole steps, like fret three to five, G to A is a whole step. Frets two to three on the A string, B to C is a half step. And every scale is made up of a certain pattern of those. So a major scale is whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And you have to know that, okay? So if you go across one string, it's very obvious to see that pattern. So two whole steps. G to A, A to B, that's two whole steps. B to C is a half step, then you've got three whole steps. And then a half step. So if you really know that pattern and understand that pattern, you can play scales anywhere. Okay, really understanding that pattern. Yes, you should know the names of the notes, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G in this key. Learning the circle of fifths and fourths is really gonna help you with that as well. I've got, I've got links to a lot of lessons that I will speak about in this video. I'll just put a link below, one link where you could go off to all those other things because I've got a circle of fifths lesson and if you learn that, then you can learn the names of the notes in every key very easily. But you know, should I learn all the shapes? There are so many shapes, just get comfortable with one. What I will say is definitely know any scale off the second finger. The first finger, that opens up a three note per string pattern. And the fourth finger. Okay, you've just got a few different ways of playing the same thing and it's gonna make you play in different ways. I really like three note per string patterns. You know, we got that's G, then you start on A, B, 
and so on. And that's a good way of expanding and learning the fretboard. But there are loads and loads of different ways. And like I say, just be really, really confident about the interval structure. You know, you've got a, a root, major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seven, an octave. We do all kinds of exercises, and why not? Let's make some proper music up. You know, make a groove up, make it musical, make it sound like real music. That's going to help you a lot. Applying it to other keys on a bass is easy. If you want to go to B flat, go three frets higher. Every pattern I played in G major now works exactly the same way, going three frets higher. If you change string, it's going to be slightly different. I mean, that was the same pattern as here, but now I've, I've you know, run out of, a, of strings here. Be very aware where your notes are. There's the G, there's the root. There's the octave. And this is just all demoed on a G major scale. You have obviously loads of other scales. The same principle applies to any scale. What do you miss out on or gain access to when you play a pentatonic scale? Not so much the literal scale degrees, but more in general, range of expression, advantages, disadvantages, limits. Pat Metheny alludes to it briefly in the Rick Beato interview. First of all, I've seen that interview, it's great. Uh, I'm sure you know who Rick Beato is, you must do, everyone does. If you don't, his channel is just one of the greatest resources for musicians, especially in terms of music theory and how music works. So really definitely check out uh, that channel. And also this interview is a great one. And, and Pat Metheny is one of my favorite players and he does use the pentatonic scale. The pentatonic scale is, you know, very earthy, rootsy, especially if you add a, a uh, flat five in there. It's the blues scale, okay? Now, a bass player that uses this a lot, an, another jazz guy actually called Jimmy Haslip, used to play for the Yellow Jackets. He uses that a lot, but, and it kind of points towards the blues. That's where it came from. And it's, it's, it's a very simple open sound. If you're a beginner bass player, just make sure you know the minor pentatonic. This is A. If you come down the second shape of it, it's the related major. So you've got A natural, uh, A minor pentatonic, C major pentatonic. Those are related scales, okay? And I love them. I, I, I always say this, that it's the scale that sort of earned me the most money as a professional bass player. It's used a lot in rock, pop, funk, blues. If those are the styles of music you love, pentatonic is going to get you really far. But those would be the advantages. It's used a lot and it's just a brilliant scale. Yes, it does have its limits and it does have its disadvantages in terms of if you're in, you know, if you're into jazz or, or even like, you know, world music styles or anything else where it's a bit too simple sounding. So in jazz, for example, just as one example, you've got like two five ones. Two five one in the key of of A major. Now over a five chord, jazz musicians like to, to alter those chords. So that just means adding in like a sharp five, a flat nine, all kinds of, of different sort of intervals like that to add tension. The pentatonic scale doesn't really have any tension. That's why it's brilliant for the other styles. It sounds quite easy listening if you like. But over this five chord, that is the seventh mode of the melodic minor scale. It's got a bunch of different names, including altered scale and super Locrian. But that has some really interesting notes in it. It's got a flat nine. It's got, you know, it's got a sharp five. It's got all kinds of intervals that are going to sound tense. So the pentatonic scale doesn't have that tension in it. And it's actually why I love it so much. I love the simplicity of it. There are a whole bunch of other scales and modes that you would probably want to call on or could call on, especially in the jazz context, to add in that tension. That's a Lydian dominant. There's another one. It's got a sharp four. If you play just the pentatonic, 
you're really, really missing out on the sharp four and that flat seven, you know, that dominant sound. So there you go. That's just a very, very short sort of summary of it. You know, jazz players, they know loads of modes, they know loads of scales and, uh, you know, rock, pop, uh, funk. You can get away with 80% you know, of the time playing the pentatonic. It's both why it's amazing and in another context, why it might be a bit limiting. How timbre for same pitch can vary based on string fret, e.g. open D string versus 10th fret of E string and which to choose. And is lower the upper fretboard any better for sitting well in a recording mix? Okay, first thing, so here's a D open string. And here's a D. You might need headphones to hear any difference. But the way I, I see it, yeah, that there is like a slight difference. And this very much depending on the bass. Really expensive, well-made basses should anyway. Be, be very even across open strings. So sometimes you have a... Uh, aluminium nut or a metal nut here to make the difference between a first fret and an open string sound consistent okay so it's very much going to be dependent on your bass um, but sometimes yeah I especially in recording sometimes I will play an open string elsewhere because it might have more sustain here just out of shot here I've got a vintage 1978 precision I love it but there are certain points on that where it doesn't sound is good so I will have to move and that might mean moving an open string to a different place so that's really about it's about knowing your bass but it's also about being comfortable playing somewhere so if uh, if something feels better to me to play an open string I'll do it so it's it, it will often be a feel thing for me and anyway, this is personal for me it'll be a feel thing rather than a sound thing but on some bases it's like oh uh, like I said, I've got a on my stingray the fifth fret of the G string, the C is like a bit of a no-go area. Probably some frets are uneven somewhere. I'd probably get it fixed. But I will avoid that area as much as possible, especially when recording. And that's a little bit annoying sometimes. I've just started doing small gigs with my band. Nothing big yet, but we're getting there. What are some words of wisdom you can pass on from your experience? Uh, I mean, a few things really. Well, first of all, great, well done for, for doing that. It's just, just keep going, really. If you're just starting out on gigs, it's really about learning your craft and it's learning what you need to know because I think a lot of people, they obsess a bit about gear and things like that. And then you get onto a, a gig and you realize that no one cares about your gear. Really, no one does. And then you realize the priority really is that everything works. I know that sounds silly, but it's true. You've got this big pedal board, you know, maybe a cable's out or something like that. You just really, on a gig, want reliable gear that you can switch on and it's going to sound good. So that's the thing. You realize performance matters. You realize playing your parts accurately matters. So it's just things like this. Make sure that if there are, it goes without saying, to me anyway, you need to know the form of every song. You need to know, uh, you, the, no surprises. You, that, that little bit coming up in that song, have you practiced enough to, to nail that bit, obviously with your band as well. So it's just, it's stagecraft, it's performance, it's, it's when you're in a band situation, as you will find out, you, you realize what matters, okay? And it's usually not the next best distortion pedal. It's just playing the songs properly. Figure out with your bandmates where you want to go with it. You know, I think playing gigs at the weekend is, is brilliant. And if you're doing it for fun, excellent. You alluded a bit to going towards bigger gigs. Do you all want to do that? If so, you have to make a commitment. You've got to reach out to venues. You've got to get your social media page going, you know, so that venues can see and hear you before they're booking you. You know, how ambitious are you? you may be really ambitious and the others aren't and that might be meaning to move to a different band so you know that there are all kinds of things the main thing really is to enjoy it because it is an enjoyable thing to do have fun make sure your gear is just is serviceable and it's going to work when you go on stage make sure you know the songs properly and just just enjoy it and get a little bit better every time that you're doing it and, and just have, have a little bit of a, a game plan for it you know where do you and the band want to go with this and and work towards it. Good luck. Any interesting circle of fourths exercises that you have used? I mean, not really, but you kind of need to know how the circle of fourths and fifths works. And I'll put a link below to a lesson I did on that. But if you start off from C major, that's the scale that has no sharps or flats. And then you can go up in fifths, uh, playing a one octave major scale. Uh, you said interesting. This isn't really that interesting, but 
you can call out the names of the notes and it helps you learn the fretboard a bit. So that's C to C, just C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And you go to G major and we have one sharp. You've got to remember father, Christmas, gives, dad, and electric bass. And then that's the order of sharps that's added each time. So this one is the, is the F. And then you go up a fifth from there every time the next sharp is added. A major. E major. B major. And so on. You can go around the circle like that and you can just sort of understand what a scale is and then what the notes are. So for example in A major that's the one with three sharps. So it's A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A. So you're learning the notes as you go. It's a note learning thing. But then, you know, once you know the notes of a scale, really what is interesting is to learn the harmony within it. So, that's way more interesting because then you can make up bass lines. and so on. So that's what I would do. I'll put a link to that exercise below as well. What strings do you use and how often do you change them? Well, I've got loads of basses around me with lots and lots of different strings. So uh, generally I use Elites, which are made by the Bass Centre in England. And I, I love the Bass Centre and it was the, the classic biggest bass shop in the world in the 80s. They've got a really great online shop now. So I use elites and I use players or stadiums. The uh, stadiums are the stainless steel, the players are the, the nickel. I've got an artist deal with them, but I still I still pay for the strings. Um, and then I, I've got some ground wound strings on, uh, on my Stingray and I didn't like them at first. Again, elites, but they're sort of halfway between stainless steel and flat wounds. And the, the strings have got different pliabilities and feels to them and, and they felt stiff to me, but I, actually, I really quite like them. I've kept them on now. But I've got labellas on my 68P bass. I've got these pyramid strings, which I haven't put on yet, but these really are the strings for Hofner basses. These are black nylon tape wound. It's the Herbie Flowers kind of sound. So I might put those on my jazz. And that's the thing really, when it comes to strings, it's, you know, what tone am I going for? So Herbie Flowers, he he never changed them. He put them on uh, his sick early 60s jazz bass and that's the tone of all those Bowie records and Harry Nilsson records. And I quite fancy replicating that tone. James Jameson had flat wounds and he kept them on. I've, I've not changed my flat wounds on my 68P bass, okay? And I generally, I generally don't like the, the zingy, zingy feel and sound of new bass strings. That was a thing very in in the 80s where you would change strings like every session. I don't personally love that. Also, I don't personally love spending loads and loads of money on strings. So I tend to not change them that often. But, you know, when they get dead, you have to change them. And if you are playing like I do, I, I, I do a lot of sessions. And uh, if I need a rock tone, you need bright, zingy, stainless steel strings. That's the tone. So if it's for something like that, I'll put a fresh set on. Otherwise, like for this bass, this is my sort of YouTube bass. I do record a bit on it, but I just tend to whack the elite strings on this and just, just keep it going, really, because I, I, I like that sound of old strings. Okay, a couple more. What pedals does one need for country bass? I'm a beginner thinking of getting an Ampeg preamp and compressor along with a Peterson stomp box. For a total of three pedals on a pedal train Nano Plus, is this a good idea? Do I need more pedals? You need no more pedals than you've got. If you're playing country, folk, uh, you know, R&B, soul, Motown, anything like that, you just need a good sounding bass. Really a precision with flat wounds will do the trick. Um, but you don't need anything for those styles of music. What do you say here? You've got Ampeg preamp, yeah, great compressor. You don't need a compressor. Some people love them. I, I hardly ever, I don't ever use compression on these videos. I hardly ever use compression live. Um, yeah, Peterson stomp box, that's a tuner. So absolutely that's vital. You can get a clip on one um, for gigs and things like that. But yeah, for that style of music, you no, know, you, you really don't need anything. Pedals are for when you, you hear a sound in your head that you want to create. If it's delay, reverb, then you need to get that. Or if you're doing a gig where you're doing covers or originals where you got, you know, it's a rock band maybe, you need overdrive, distortion. 
Um, yeah, like I say, covers band, you might need an envelope filter, an octave pedal, chorus, you know, if you're covering lots of different styles. For your situation, country bass playing, just no pedals is better than, <laughs> than a big pedal board. So, you know, you don't need anything more. I put out a post on YouTube, you know, asking people to, to comment if they've got any questions for this Q&A. If you like this format, let me know. I'll do more of these and you can really ask me whatever you like. Um, so Paul says, in response to, have you got any questions? He says, yes, different amplifiers, tube V class D. Okay, look, I, I basically know nothing about the different types of amp. I, I wonder if he's talking about tube versus solid state. I've got an Ampeg 1966 B15. That's the holy grail of, of tube bass amps that people used a lot. And then you have the SVT. Now they're heavy, they're expensive to run, they can be a bit temperamental, but tube amps have this very pleasing harmonic saturation when you push them, they just sound amazing, okay? So for the studio, well actually for the studio, I, I hardly use amps at all these days because you've got emulations, I'm using universal audio stuff, which is, sounds great, okay? But when, when it's live, I've got this uh, Mark Bass uh, combo that attaches to a one by 12 and it's 500 watts, it's, it's really loud. And I don't, it's really light, and that's the big thing. So tube amps are heavy, they're expensive, you've got to be careful with them. So if it, unless I was in some sort of band with roadies and they, they're taking care of all the gear or backlines hired in, for me it's solid state, it's light stuff that, that sounds good. These days there's amazing stuff with Aguilar, with Mark Bass, Trick Fish, you know, there's, you, you name it, there's just amazing amps that are light and, and sound brilliant. It used to be the case that you had to really go tube, whereas I definitely prefer tube for the disadvantage of, of them live, I, I will go solid state more or less every time. Okay, that was just a very, very short video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do like that format, I mean, I've got to find a way of doing it because I've got actually quite a lot of subscribers now, but only nine comments of, uh, from the Q&A. So, you know, if you've got a question you want to ask, maybe I'll start like a, I don't know, I'll put a question below, I'll start a little thing, and then if I get enough questions, I'll do, I'll do another one of these. Could be completely boring to you, or maybe you got something from it. I don't know. Let me know, but thanks anyway for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.